There, there is several of them. I know that. Any reports? Or we can just use the one on my joy. You gotta trust the joy app. <laughs> I don't know. Do you trust the joy app? I trust it. Is it are you sure it's the right joy app? <laughs> Stop it. Be nice. Be nice. You sure it's not a Trojan? Stop. Stop. It's not nice. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> I'm getting back at all those people who beat me up on Google Plus. Or just for being an Can you do me did, a did favor? You, did you guys decide on who was going to go first? Yeah, one? Kurt is going first. Okay. This one is free. I like free. Okay. Yeah. Because at the end we're going to be a plaza meter. I needed it. I just need it. So we're live. It's going. We're live? Yep. Okay. Can you, Janet's over there. Can you help her make sure it gets, she's, she's using a map that she doesn't normally use. Can you <laughs> go help Janet get the so, closed one? Yeah. Neither one of us are not. Oh. Um. Okay. Okay. Excellent. I'll do that Okay, so here's the issue. It's showing that screen, not this screen. Oh, okay. So I'll use my notes off of here. Okay. So then I'll mirror these and hope it does not crash the... You've got to upgrade to Keynote. Uh, no. So you guys do not want a microphone? 20 bucks? No. I don't want to spend any money. I don't want to spend any money for that. Mirroring is on. So, uh, you got to go into preferences, I think. In preferences in PowerPoint. Hmm. It's funny, I didn't have to do that before. You advanced edit view general maybe, maybe it's not in PowerPoint, maybe it's in that. You were in slideshow wait, slideshow. Uh, did you go into presenter view? No, that's what we had before. No, before you went into yeah, presenter I think view? That's what we had before it was presenter view. Oh, that's it again. No, we don't want that. Swap displays. Swap displays. That's no, horrible. No, that's <laughs> horrible. Yeah. Come on. What about if you join the displays as one? Like yeah, I, I was doing that in the on the operating system, not right? The, yeah, and it doesn't doesn't want to do it. So you play from start. Switch displays. Yeah, that's not it. That's not it. I think you'd be able to hear your voices even if you wander away from the podium. No. I mean, whatever the mic picks up, and it's usually pretty good. So you got to stay pretty close to the podium, like in yeah. this area, for it to be picked up. Yep. Okay. So. I can't show you. you got to figure this out. Okay. They'll see this, but nobody else will see that. Preferences. Can you turn off notes? Maybe it's got presenter notes or something like that. We're just working out the sure panel notes. because we've had requests to uh, live stream this, so we're going to go into a Google Hangout and mm -hmm. broadcast live. So we're just uh, streaming to the people. Yes. It's it's live right now. 
is live right now. Hello, people at home. Can you hear us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> Slideshow. Set up show. Uh, we're going to put a, because we've been tweeting about it. Presented by an individual window. Maybe that's it? Or kiosk. I don't know. Mm. Oh, yeah. Just the first Never really used this. I don't want to use the word. Um, for, no, we've, we've live streamed other events, but in a more traditional sense, in that we've had you know, cameras set up and a um, live streaming service. Why don't we try to go with that one? Yeah. Yeah, you Sorry, have to. Is that me? That was yeah. me. Oh, one stick on the live stream is working, and it is. It is working. Okay. <laughs> that was the interference thing here. Um, okay. Yeah. And they've got it? Got yeah. it. So, so if you don't um, mind. This is different because we're using Google Hangout to do this. Now, if you want to know more about Google Hangout, okay. Google Good. Plus. Thank you. Tomorrow night, we have Lynette Young here, who is uh, yeah. by the fireplace, and she's written a book on Google Plus, and which incorporates Google Hangout. Um, so she's going to be here tomorrow night. Um, her book is geared towards small businesses and entrepreneurs, but you know anybody can learn from her what she teaches. She teaches here at the library regularly on Google Plus, and I think she's going to do a class on um, Google Drive, which is their new cloud service, um, which is their replacing Google, Google Docs. Docs. Is their new Google Drive? What's that? Their old Google Docs is their new Google, Google Drive. Google Drive. Right. Yeah. So they used to use Google Docs. It's now called Google Drive, and it's got some different features on it. Um, I should have a tip. Jan, did you know where that class is? I can find it. Okay. So we're starting very informally here, which is a good thing because this night is meant to be fun and informal. Uh, Jan, actually, you want to stand up and give a wave here? Um, I recognize a lot of people in the audience because for many years, um, I'm sure you know, I taught technology training here. And uh, Janet Hay is uh, our new technology training librarian and helping run the technology center. So she's here, and what she's going to be doing up front here is live tweeting under the tag of PPL Smackdown. So if you're a Twitter user, you can follow along at pound PPL Smackdown. We're calling this the Smartphone Smackdown. Okay, so let's get going tonight. And I'm going to get over here because I think it'll probably look better on the microphone for our, our audience who is live at home. So tonight we're not debating the actual devices because there are many devices, but we're looking at the operating systems that run the devices. Or on the coins of Droid, there's many devices. Um, <laughs> before we can get started, I want to know who here is in what I'm going to call the Apple Army, the Apple side of things. Okay, give a wave or give a, give a woo -hoo. Okay, and who here are proud Droid defenders? Woo! -hoo. Okay. Whoops. I'm supposed to be neutral, I forgot. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm neutral. I am for tonight I am neutral. Okay. So our two competitors tonight don't need much introduction, I'm sure. They're both extremely active in the world of social media and in all the local tech slash geek circles. Um, we were asked earlier today via social networks, and we want to make it very clear that neither contestant works for Apple or Google. Neither speaker will gain anything tonight in the way of material compensation. They are here as citizens to defend their system, <clears throat> and only bragging rights will be given once a winner is determined. So now it's time for the main event, and let me introduce you to our esteemed presenters and then give you the rules. Going first, they battled it out to see who would go first, and it is Kurt. So here to tell you about the merits and advantages of iOS. Oh, and we have smartphones going off. How appropriate. <laughs> um, and other mobile devices is Kurt Williams. Kurt is a senior advisor in information security compliance at Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh oh, I'm getting interference, Catherine. Okay, so we should probably all turn our smartphones off for the smartphone debate. Uh, Kurt is a senior advisor in information security compliance at Bristol Myers Squibb. He's also president of the Princeton Macintosh Users Group and an all around Apple fanboy. That's true. This is it. On the other side of the debate, stand up over there and give a wave, Mr. Lamosny. We have John Lamosny here to sing the praises of Android. John is manager of educational technology training and outreach for the Educational Technology Center at Princeton University. He also teaches here at the library many evenings. You'll find him upstairs in our own tech center. And he's an advocate of open source in general and a self-described droid fan. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. So for tonight. We 
flip the coin more or less to see who takes the podium first, and that will be Kurt. Each presenter has between 20 to 30 minutes to make their case. We will then take up to six questions from the audience. Note that I said questions, not comments. <laughs> <laughs> Just make a note of that. We I'll take all the comments. <laughs> we can take comments after we get the winner determined. But questions first. Uh, at the end of the formal part, we will use our applause meters on our various devices. I have one and Kurt has one to decide a winner. In the event of a tie, well, I've been threatening them with the dance-off, Gangnam style, but I'm told that this will be a hot mess if, even if they do attempt it. So let's just hope we do not have a tie. Anyhow, it is on with the show, and Kurt, take away. Thank you. Yes. Go to Facebook. It's on our page. Okay. So I had a presentation set up where most of these devices that I have, my iPhone, my iPad, my Apple TV, which all run iOS, by the way. Uh, most of my devices were set up tonight as part of the... Oh. Is that on? No. Oh. By the way, that microphone is made by Apple. Yeah, it's not on. There you go. There you go. I turned it back off again. Do we need to turn the volume down on your Mac? Maybe it's... Yeah, that's why we didn't have it on. You just turned your sound off. There you go. I orchestrated this by the way. Testing, testing. Okay, second start. Um, so when I initially set up this presentation, I uh, started off the presentation on my Mac and finished it up on my iPad, and that, that was actually part of the demonstration, was how I went seamlessly between devices. Um, and I had all the devices hooked up in such a way that I could walk around and, and show you what the, one of the benefits were. Uh, but you'll have to take my word for it in this case because uh, we're doing it via Google Plus. So in order to do that, we have to capture the, the screen of the presentation. So I'll start here so you can hear what I had set up. That was the original intro. <laughs> okay. So hail to the victor, whoever wins tonight. So, um, as Janie said, I'm an Apple fanboy. I have uh, one of each of these devices, with the exception of the one on the uh, on your far right, um, the iPad, iPhone 5, the iPhone 4, iPhone 3DS, and today Apple announced the iPad Mini, a 7-inch iPad, which I think makes John's device obsolete, but. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so all of these devices, including the four-year-old iPhone 3GS, can all run the current version of iOS that's shipping. That's iOS 6. So a four-year-old device can still run the current version of Apple's uh, mobile operating system. One of the reasons why I like Apple's products and I was talking to John earlier about uh, ecosystems. So all the devices I have work together. Um, and, you know, when you buy these devices, they, they serve a purpose. You want to entertain yourself, you want to be informed, and you just want to get things done. That's the reason you bought it. You want to watch movies, music, uh, listen to music, watch TV shows, read books, and download apps that can make your life more productive or just plain fun. My kids love Angry Birds. They love Cut the Rope, and I guess the, the latest one they're playing is some Minecraft thing on, on, on the iPad. Uh, on the iOS platform is a wide selection of quality content um, at competitive prices. Uh, I looked at my son and I said, you know, I think Nintendo is dead as a handheld gaming company. 
because with the with, with the iPod Touch, which is roughly the same as, as the cost of a as a Nintendo DS, for the same fifty dollars he would spend on one game cartridge at uh, for Nintendo, he can buy fifty games for his iPod Touch. Okay, and a lot of the games are free. Uh, international availability, so. I dug deep because I really wanted to look for things that were differentiating the platforms. And even though Android has by far the largest market share of installed base of users, um, most of the content that you would want on your device, movies, music, TV shows, books, are not available outside of the United States on the Android platform. Google Play, which is the, the, the Google Play store for buying that content, does not operate outside of the US, as opposed to uh, iOS, which is available in, at last count, uh, up to 73 countries. Okay? Uh, as I mentioned, interruptible across all devices, um, and Game Center, which I'll get to in just a moment. So the choice of what phone or tablet to buy is one of <coughs> That often involves many considerations. Uh, chief among these is the physical device itself and the operating system that it runs. But I think there's a third consideration. What services and entertainment ecosystems you'll need, you'll have to be able to access. As I just mentioned, uh, iOS by far has a, a lot of it. But the other thing is Game Center. Um, so Game Center is something that was first brought to iOS devices as a way for users to hook together all their top scores and so forth between the games that they purchased. But then it morphed into something more. Anyone familiar with the Xbox and the PlayStation and how people play games across the internet? Well, Game Center brings that to these mobile devices as well. So my son could sit at home on his, on his iPad and play with his friend against his friend in Somerset on his iPad. So it brings a social aspect to gaming. Um, but what Apple did recently was that they, because of their ecosystem, they brought that very same game center to the Mac operating system, OS X Mountain Lion. So now, on OS X, if there's a version of that game available for OS X, I could play it on my Mac against my son playing on his iPad. Okay. Even if he's somewhere else in the world, so long as he's got network access, I can play that game with him. So again, complete ecosystem for all the content you've just purchased. Um, Apple also added uh, something which I'm uh, sure is available on the Android as well, which is something called AirPlay. So what AirPlay allows me to do is any video content on my iPad or my iPhone, I can send directly to my Mac's screen. or if I have an Apple TV device, and give me a second. If I've got one of these little devices, little black box, this little black box will also receive that content off my iPhone or my iPad and send it directly to my large screen HD TV with the tap of a button. So I'm watching a YouTube video. And I go, you know, this would be great to share with the family. We don't have to crowd around the little four-inch screen on the iPhone. We don't have to crowd around the little nine-inch screen on the iPad. We can send it right up to the big screen TV on the wall, right? instantly. Okay. Sorry. So, how available is that content? As I mentioned. So again, I dug deep, went all over the internet today, and I found out that it, in terms of percentage of world population who have access to the services I just mentioned, movies, music, uh, TV shows, books, and apps, um, Amazon's doing fairly well, Microsoft is doing fairly well, and Apple's doing fairly well. Google, not so much, except when it comes to the app segment. There are a lot of app stores for, for Android. So there are app stores in Russia, there are app stores in China. If you feel safe downloading apps from those stores, go right ahead. I wouldn't. Um, but they're available if you want to.
So this was uh, Rene Ricci, who's, uh, I forget where he was writing, I don't have my notes here, but uh, he basically said Google's lack of international content offerings still hurt them in terms of overall value proposition of their platform. I think it's kind of uh, telling that the number one selling um, tablet for Android OS isn't even an Android OS device. It's an Android OS based device. It's the Kindle Fire. And it's the only device so far that's been able to uh, give the iPad a run for its money. And I think the simple reason is Amazon has a app store, Amazon has a music store, a movie store, and a TV store, and you can still buy your, your diapers and get them delivered the next day. But they have a complete ecosystem for shopping. I think this is really where uh, Google is missing that it's not all about the hardware, it's not all about the, the geeky parts of, of things, it's really people just trying to live their lives and get stuff that they want. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, I started the presentation off uh, creating the presentation on my Mac, on my iMac at home, uh, finished it up on my iPad, and was all set today to present off the iPad using my iPhone as a controller. But I can't show you that right now. Um, but what enables, ooh, enables me to do that, sorry about that, I guess there was a conversion error, is uh, iCloud, which offers me the ability to set up my iPad or my iPhone as a, how should I put it, um, a PC-free device. Uh, when you buy a new iPad or a new iPhone, you can set it up completely with one swipe of your finger. You don't need to hook it up to a, to a Mac or, or a Windows machine to configure it. You do it completely off the device. And they do that via iCloud. iCloud is Apple's uh, cloud synchronization technology, which simply means that any mail that I receive on my iPhone, I could also read via my Mac or via my iPad. If I update a contact on my iPad, it's instantly updated on my iPhone. It's instantly updated on my Mac. I don't have to do anything. Uh, since I have my iPhone, I've been taking a lot of more pictures with my phone than I do with my, uh, my Nikon. Okay. And the reason for that is, I shoot a photo here, it's instantly available on my iPad for viewing. It's instantly available on my Mac at home. I can call my wife and say, hey, go to the Mac, launch iPhoto, and boom, she just saw the picture I took. No more, I have to go home, hook up a cable, download it. Those days are gone, it's completely cable free. Uh, my documents are all stored in the cloud. Uh, photo stream, which I just mentioned before. Uh, the iPad and the iPhone both have cameras. Any photo I take, automatically goes to this thing called photo stream, which means that um, the last 1,000 photos I take are automatically backed up. I don't have to, if I lose a device, if I'm on vacation, snapping away on my phone, and I lose my phone or it gets stolen, no big deal. I come home, I get a new phone, I launch my iMac, I launch iPhoto, and boom, there are all the pictures from my photo stream. Okay, so never lose a document again. Find my iPhone, which is, uh, to me, is more of a gimmick than actually a feature, but uh, find my iPhone basically enables you to, from your Mac or from an iPad, figure out where your iPhone is. I don't know, you know if you lose your phone around the house like I do sometimes, where did I put it? Well, I can just, you know, go to my iPad and tell me, tell me where the iPhone is, make it beep, and I can run across the room and grab it. Um, no longer, you don't have to waste your phone minutes calling your phone to find out where it is. Find my friends, which is one of the creepier services. <laughs> or friendlier services. Uh, it's creepy. Find my phone, uh, my friends. Uh, this works similar to find my iPhone. Uh, basically, if all your friends and family agree to it, you can, you, can, you can add them to your phone list in such a way that you can tell where they are at any point. Uh, I guess it's, it's opt-in version of Foursquare. I don't know. Um, and so I sort of use it a lot of the times uh, to find out um, oh, is my son using his iPad when he shouldn't be? I can kind of find out where it is. Uh, it's kind of I know, it's, it's kind of <laughs> It is creepy. 
I have to admit. I really don't use it, but other than to, to you know, when I suspect that he's, he's not doing his homework when he should be. Uh, and iMessage, which uh, was one of the most useful features to me when I got the iPhone. Uh, up until then, we had regular phones, and every time I got a text message, I paid a little bit of money. Every time I sent a text message, I paid a little bit of money. With iMessage, what Apple did was that if you were an iPhone user sending a text message to another iPhone user, the messages are completely free. You're basically bypassing AT&T, T-Mobile, or whoever, Sprint, sorry, Sprint, and Verizon completely. So my text message plan went to this, because everybody in the family had iPhones. Because I told them to get iPhones. <laughs> well, they had no choice. Um, this is Siri, and I really wish I could have demoed Siri. Because Siri's, Siri's uh, I don't find it terribly useful, because I don't like really like talking to machines. Um, but it is a lot of fun to play with. Uh, I actually tried to ask her out on the date, and she said no. Um, but Siri is awesome. I, any simple command, Siri, find me the nearest library. Boom, up she says, I found five libraries. Prince of Macintosh, you know, the Princeton Public Library is the closest library to you. Uh, if you're on the iPhone, you say, Siri, call the nearest library. She'll find the nearest library and call the number for you. Uh, Siri, show me all the G-rated movies playing nearby, and she'll pop up and find all the, the list of movies and show them to you. You can say, Siri, yeah, buy me the movie ticket. She will find what movie it is, launch the Fandango app, and proceed to purchase the ticket for you. So, uh, yeah, I, it, it's, it, it's fun. I haven't really found a use for it in my day-to-day -day life, but um, a lot of people like it, my kids especially. Oh, sorry. And Siri speaks English, French, Spanish, Italian, German, French, and uh, Korean, Mandarin, and Cantonese. Wow. Yeah. And so I get my notes up. Uh, Siri will also give you um, studio information. If you say, Siri, you know, who starred in, who was the guy who played Thor in the Avengers? Uh, she will pull up that information for you. Uh, you know, give me information on um, some famous actor. She'll pull that up information up for you. Um, give me all the show times for all the theaters playing Avengers in the area, and she'll show that to you. Um, and if the movie is not, if the movie you requested is actually not in the theater, she will actually tell you that and say, hey, it's not in the theater, but it is available in iTunes for purchase. Yeah. Apple, I'm sure, likes that, too. Um, next is, well, the AirPlay, which I mentioned before, this, the, the feature where, you know, I have content on my iPad, but I've decided that I'd rather watch it on my big screen TV easy to zap it over to the Apple TV. Now, I know we're supposed to be talking about uh, uh, iOS, right? So Apple TV runs iOS. Is that included here? Yeah. So Apple TV also runs uh, iOS and is part of the uh, Apple ecosystem. Think of it as an iPad or iPhone without the phone and without the screen. So you can stream any of the content that's available in your iTunes library. You can stream Netflix content, uh, Hulu, MLB, uh, what else? Football. And it's stuff being added every day. I mean, it, there's just tons of stuff they can do. Uh, I'm hoping that someday most of the content will be available for streaming so I can cut the cable cord. Because uh, I actually did a spreadsheet analysis, this is what I do, of uh, how much I spent on cable. And if I was to get every piece of my content via iTunes or Hulu or Netflix, I could still save $500 a year over my cable bill, even if I had to pay for all that content. And I actually just dropped my uh, Netflix disk subscription. It was pointless. Okay, AirPlay. 
Uh, so AirPlay streams any video content, H.264, that's say standard, 720p, 1080p video, MPEG-4 video, which is also a standard, from a Mac, from an iPhone, iPhone or an iPad, or an iPad mini, forgot to include that, to an Apple TV. M4V formats, MP4 formats, MOV file formats, and AVI file formats. So basically any standard uh, video or, or audio file format it will handle. Okay. Okay. So here's the part of the presentation where I go totally negative. Sorry. So those were those are not all the positive features of, of iOS. It's just that most of them require me to actually do demo. Since I'm not doing demo, I'm going to go to the other part of my presentation. We're going to talk about some of the things uh, I like about iOS that I think, um, if not the Android OS itself, at least the Android marketplace uh, fails. So open. We hear that a lot when referring to, uh, to Android. It's open. So I thought about that for a long time, and I decided open is not a feature. Uh, open is something that developers care about. How many people in this room are developers? Great, you don't care about open. What you care about is, can I get the video content? Can I get the music I want? Can I get the apps I want to do something useful? For you, open means nothing. For developers, yes. It means a lot, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think it's kind of weird how Android uses Bash iPhones for not being open, um, because I haven't found one person able to explain to me why that's any sort of advantage, other than what I mentioned before, developers. Uh, it creates confusion for users, and it seems to be only an opportunity for Android geeks to spend a lot of time hacking the phone to be able to do what you want it to do, when an iPhone already does most of it out of the box anyway. So unless you're a developer, which you aren't, open, it doesn't matter. Then I started to look at the actual implementation of Android on Android-based phones. So uh, Android Central was a lovely website. Love to hang out there sometimes. Uh, on Android Central, the most complaints I saw were from people trying to find out how to avoid the lockdown bootloaders from Samsung, HTC, LG, uh, was it Sony, or a few others that have locked, taken the open source Android operating system and locked it down on the phone, thereby nullifying the whole open argument, right? If you can't take the device, rip out the operating system, tweak it to your heart's content, and push it back the way you want it, then where are we? We're back to where we were. So these lockdown bootloaders prevent you from doing that. So every time I go on the Android Central looking for an argument, the first thing I do is say, how is that lockdown bootloader working for you? Boy, do I get some nasty responses. Um, so the platform is defined by lockdown bootloaders in actual implementation and actual use. Having it in your hand means it's locked down and closed just like an iPhone. Okay. The vendors, the cell phone providers and the vendors, Samsung and others, they fill up the devices with what I call non-removable apps. They're just default. You can't remove them. You can't replace them. So it's no different than having the, uh, the iPhone and you can't remove the mail app or you can't remove Safari. So my point is, it's the same thing. Right? So open again isn't a feature. Uh, then, the delays and upgrades and patches. I work in information security. <laughs> and whenever there is a security vulnerability in an Android device and we have to post out a notice, we never have to. We never have a follow-up posting that says, "Here's the patch. Here's why." Apparently, Google is really good at patching the holes in their OS. However, Samsung, HTC, LG, whoever else you want to name, they're terrible at getting you those patches. Okay. So what happens is 
Google patches it. Samsung gets that piece of software and says, well, we need to test it on all of our devices. And they take as long as possible to do that. They may take six months to do that. They may take nine months. Sometimes they never do it. I have a friend, uh, I don't know if she's here in the audience today. I have a friend who has a, uh, six months ago, I guess, was it ice, ice cream sandwich? Whatever the latest thing was from Android. It seems like there's a new Android update like every eight months or so. There was an update and she said, oh, really excited about it. She wanted to put it on her phone. So she went to the Samsung website. Now, her Galaxy S phone was six months old, right? Six months old. She couldn't find the update. She waited, she waited, she waited, she waited. Months went by. I said, hey, did you ever get your phone upgraded? She's like, no, they never issued the, they never issued the upgrade. So she decided to go to her provider. I think in this case it was T-Mobile. You know what the guy at T-Mobile told her to do? Oh, you want ice cream sandwich? Yeah. Buy a new phone. Buy a new phone. That appears to be the normal operating procedure for uh, the Android handset makers. You've got a device that's six months old, a year old, which is not really old, right? Six months to a year old. And the only way you can get a patch or an upgrade is to buy a new device. Okay. I can't imagine what the computer market would be like if Microsoft issued an update or a new OS and the only way you could possibly get it was to go buy a brand new computer because Dell would refuse to release the patch or uh, whoever sold you the machine, Best Buy refused to give you a patch. What said the market worked the same way? It would be terrible. We'd all be running Windows with ME at this point, right? Because the only way you'd be able to run it is to buy a brand new machine. And I don't know about you, but my computers, I buy them to last at least five to six years, if not more. So for me, this whole patching, the way they address patching was all wrong. Now, iOS 6 just came out recently. Every single iOS device from the 3GS, the 4, the iPhone 4S, the iPad 2, the iPad 3, of course the iPad mini and I, uh, the new iPad are new, all got availability of that upgrade the same day. In fact, uh, I think I have some numbers here. Sorry, I'm trying to jump forward a little bit. But basically I have numbers that show that um, within the month that iOS 6 was released, 61% of all devices that could run it had upgraded to it. When I looked at the same um, adoption rate for Android devices, I found out that 60%, the same number of Android devices, were still running a version of Android that was new back in 2010. Okay. But why? Because they can't get it. So any Android device you buy right now, think of it as being bought as is. It's probably not upgradable. Or at least, the, when I say not upgradable, the uh, vendors won't let you upgrade it. This is another thing, uh, Passbook versus uh, NFC. NFC stands for Near Field Communications. It's just a piece of electronics you can stick into a device that allows uh, it to send code to a reader, from, from a phone to a reader, that allows you to do different sort of transactions. It can be used to, uh, to pay for, for concert tickets. It can be used to pay for items at the grocery store. It can also be used for device-to-device uh, -device communication, so pass information between devices. It's a great idea. The iPhone doesn't have it. Good number of Android devices do have it. And um, the iPhone was always giving a lot of flack for not having it. So I started to dig. Uh, dig into NFC adoption rate. What I found is that retailers aren't adopting NS NFC at all. So you may have NFC in your, in your Android device, but there are very few places you can actually use it. I think you can actually use it on the PATH trains and the, and the trains in New York City, but I don't know any retailer in this part of New Jersey that uses an NFC reader. And the reason is it requires all the points of present, all the points of sale, 
to upgrade the equipment to support NFC. Um, NFC information is also transmitted in the clear, so if someone wants to listen in and they're close by enough, uh, this is what's called a handbag bump. They walk up behind you and bump your handbag, and as you're transmitting from your phone, they've collected the information. Okay. Um, so there's a security issue with NFC that still needs to be addressed by the industry. However, Passbook, which is not a payment processing system, you cannot use it to pay for anything. What Passbook is, is a way that you can keep all those little cards that you get, the little uh, CVS card and the Walmart card and the Walgreens card and the Starbucks card, the Fandango ticket, your plane ticket, instead of walking around with all those pieces of paper or plastic, you can have those pulled into Passbook. And the reason why I think that's better than having NFC today is that Passbook works today without any infrastructure changes. All the developers need to do is add a few lines of code. In fact, you today can go home, go to a website, and create your own Passbook ticket for, uh, for, for iPhone. It doesn't require a whole lot. So in the future, Apple will probably put NFC in once all the systems have been upgraded. But today, NFC is a feature. Again, it's like open. It's a feature you really can't use, so it's not really a feature. Privacy. OK, privacy. So Apple sells iPhones, iPads, iPods, Macs, Apple TVs, Google sells advertising, and you. So let me say that again. Apple sells product, devices that you buy, that you can use to buy music and movies and apps and other things. They sell actual physical goods. Google sells advertising and you. Those two things are actually linked. Google's entire business is based on advertising. The entire business. The reason why people love Google search is it delivers the right search item, but it always still delivers ads on the other side of the page. Gmail, fantastic, I love it. It delivers ads on the other side of the page based on what's in my email. Google Plus is a giant social network designed to help advertisers collect more followers. So, the Android operating system, what is Google's incentive to develop an operating system? Do they make hardware products? Well, actually, they kind of do because they bought Motorola. No, they bought Motorola. It's Google Motorola, so I, that's Google. They make hardware, but only recently. But Google sells advertising. So what do you think the Android operating system is actually designed to do? Five minutes more, OK. It's designed to generate more advertising traffic for Google. Developers like to get paid. So I did some digging. Android platform seems to attract people who like free, because the operating system is open and it's free. But they like free as in free beer, not free as in free to do whatever I want with my operating system. So uh, some market researchers that two-thirds of Android users have never bought apps. So if you're a developer, yeah, you want to be developing for iOS, because they're willing to pay for quality apps. And you can look at the numbers at the bottom there, but percentage of apps paid in the Android market, 1.3% of the customers pay for apps, versus 13.5% in the App Store. So here's a developer, John Leck Johansson, developer of Double Twist, a uh, desktop uh, and Windows app that allows you to synchronize your content to your Android device, similar to what you do in iTunes. And he said, Google's mismanagement of the Android market, uh, noting that one should not need a PhD in computer science to use a smartphone, and that Google does far too little to curate the Android market. Top paid apps in iTunes, games, like bad, bad piggies. Top paid apps in the Android market, a keyboard replacement, a root explorer file manager, 
you kind of see there's two different demographics for this product. Okay. Here's a, a breakdown of global stats on developers. And globally, 60% prefer to develop for iOS versus 40%, roughly 40% on Android. And it breaks down like that all across the world except for India, which has a 50-50 split. Security. I liken shopping in the uh, iTunes and the App Store for Apple to shopping at the mall at Short Hills. You've got security, you've got a clean mall, you've got stores that you recognize, brands that you recognize, and if you have a problem, you can come back tomorrow and talk to the same shop owner. Shopping in the Android marketplace is kind of like going to a bazaar. You don't know who you're buying from, you don't know if the product you're buying is actually what it's stated to be, and if you come back tomorrow, the guy's gone. So buyer beware. So the real problem with Android security isn't malware that requires a fool's active cooperation. The trouble is that Google still doesn't do anything enough to check the security risk of the applications they're going to the store. Anyone for 25 bucks, you can become an Android developer, develop an app, and stick it in the, in the store. That's it. That's all that's required. No background checks. No checks to see if, uh, if Joe really is Joe. Nothing. So, uh, Android is sick. No, sorry, the Android market is sick. And here's uh, the adoption rate, again, showing that uh, Gingerbread, which is a two-year-old Android operating system, is still the dominant one. So if, if you're hoping to develop for the latest and greatest on, uh, on Android, nope. We talked about the patching and upgrade problems, and then the permissions. So Android has this thing where um, the user is presented with a bunch of uh, permissions, letting the user know what the app wants to do with the operating system. It's a great idea. I think it's a fantastic idea. The problem is Google doesn't check these permissions. So for instance, this is cut the rope free. It's, it's a game. So why does a game need access to SMS messages? Why does a game need, need access for full internet access uh, and access to my storage card on my, on my device? Right? Those are the questions you should ask yourself if, if a game starts to do that. So this is actually not the real cut the rope. This is a Trojan cut the rope. But here's a real app. This is the official Rovio app. But it requires the same exact permissions. So there's no way an Android naive Android user is going to know the difference between a piece of malware in the Android market and the actual software that they're looking for. And actually, that is it. Um, just to wrap up, I don't hate the Android OS. I hate the way Google manages the Android marketplace. And I hate the way that Samsung, LG, and HTC screw up a really good operating system. If you need to contact me uh, to ask me more about security on, on the devices, you can reach me in any of those places. Thank you. Okay, so we have heard the Apple side of the story from Kurt. Our presenters are shaking hands for the audience at home. Great respect being shown here. Okay, now he's going to tear system. me apart. And now we we'll let Mr. Lamazzi take this a stand to tell us about the awesomeness that is Android. <laughs> Thank you, Janie. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Let me just make sure that our show is still going. It is indeed. Thank you, Google Plus. Oh, question from home. Does anybody, do either of you know the total number of apps per respective operating system? Uh, it's almost a billion on iOS. I don't know. Less than a billion. <laughs> enough on both? <laughs> enough on both is more than enough on both, actually. The numbers don't matter, the numbers don't matter very much. We were talking earlier about the Google Drive class on uh, November the 8th. Google Drive online storage meetings. We have to do from 6.30 to 8.30 on November the 8th. And we need to register. You do not need to register. We're open. Do not need to register. Give it its early and let us see.
she, no, no problem. I'm going to try very hard to speak without a microphone. Can you all hear me? Good. So my presentation, I love Android. I, this is such a great opportunity to talk to you about this. And I really am going to focus on the operating system as opposed to some of the peripheral issues uh, that Kurt focused on. Not because I wouldn't love to talk about those things, but because the operating system is really what I wanted to focus on tonight. And there are issues in both ecosystems. There are issues with security in some cases. There are issues with distribution in some cases. You are going to encounter that on any platform, whether it be a desktop operating system, whether it be a mobile operating system. And all you can do is rely on Apple and Google to do the best job that they can to resolve those issues. In the case of Apple, it's a whole ecosystem. They control everything from start to finish. One of the things that Kurt mentioned is this idea that we're not only dealing with Google and their operating system, but also Samsung and all these other developers. And all of a sudden, you know, you get into issues where the way that Samsung handles their part of the business may be different than the way that Google handles their part of the business. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, later as to why I prefer to use Nexus devices, because Google has sort of a branded point of view that they want you to use if you want to have the best possible Android experience, and that's Nexus. So let's get into this. So if you've seen this icon, uh, even down to the icon itself, uh, they make the kernel, which is the underlying actual operating system, open source. What does that mean? It means that, for example, uh, you, if you wanted to, you could hire somebody to develop a new device that ran the operating system that is the same as all these phones that are being sold. Yes, you are not a developer, but you benefit from developers who use open source operating systems all the time. Who here has a Kindle? Did you know that Kindle runs Android? Kindle Fire runs Android underneath of it. Uh, so one of the things that Android does not do is emphasize the fact that they run Android underneath of it. And so very often Kindle and Android are presented separately as separate uh, sort of ecosystems. They are in fact different ecosystems because you can buy different products with an Android and buy different products with a Kindle. But underneath each of them is this operating system, this open source kernel. If Android had wanted to use iOS as the base of their operating system for the Kindle, they would have had to have gone to Apple, probably begged, <laughs> paid a lot of money in order to license it, and would have had a different operating system underneath. Instead, they were able to very quickly get up to speed with a full-blown operating system because they just used Android, which was open source. They were able to develop it to their own needs. And there are many developers that do this. You don't need to be a developer in order to benefit from open source as a base. So one of the arguments that we hear very often between iOS as an, as an ecosystem and Android as an ecosystem is this idea of fragmentation. Has anybody ever heard Android referred to as fragmented? No? Yes. So what does that mean? It means that you have many devices, you have many versions and flavors, you have iterations out there, and things are not standard. Right, they're not standard. And that messiness, if we're going to refer to it as fragmentation as opposed to choice, is, in my opinion, part of the beauty of Android. The fact that not every device is exactly the same, and there are many other possibilities for each of the devices. I happen to revel in that chaos. I really like the idea of choices as opposed to one solid streamlined point of view. Because the minute that I want something outside of that streamlined point of view, I'm out of luck. I don't have the opportunity to do something different than what Apple, for example, wants me to do. Can you give an example? Sure. Um, I will very specifically, actually, in a minute. Um, so multiple form factors, published design guidelines, and ROM images. So multiple form factors means that Android devices come in lots of different 
pixel widths, in other words, bigger screens, smaller screens, tiny screens, sometimes no screen at all. And anybody who wants to develop these devices can go ahead and develop them. They don't have to get permission from Google in order to do it. Google does, however, publish guidelines to make the best possible outcome. So if a developer cares to, they can go to Google's published guidelines and say, what's the best practice here? What do you want us to present to customers? And so even though they can completely ignore those guidelines, the guidelines do exist, and Google does provide them in order to do that. Uh, one of the things that Kurt was talking about was this idea that um, if you get, let's say, a Samsung device, there might be software on there on the device as it was sold to you at Best Buy that does not easily get removed. However, because Android is open, uh, if you have devices that have unlocked bootloaders, for example, you can theoretically throw your own image onto the device, if you even care. <laughs> you don't necessarily need to see that icon just because a piece of software is present on the device. You can not show it on your desktop, on your, on your home screen, for example. But if you care about having a truly uh, controlled device, you can remove the operating system as it is on the device itself, and you can replace it with a customized image so that you can have control over the finest details of the way that that operating system works. It is a very geeky thing. It is uh, not something that everybody should do or can do uh, with their technical knowledge. But the availability of that option is there. Just because Samsung gives you the device as it is doesn't mean you have to keep it that way. That is a little bit different in other ecosystems. One of the things that uh, surprised me recently was uh, in Apple's new devices, they are removing the 30-pin connector. The 30-pin connector is a wide connector. Do you have an example of a 30-pin connector? Thank you. This edge of this dongle is a 30-pin connector. This 30-pin connector worked with most every iPad up until recently. The iPad 5, no, the iPhone 5, 4, 5, uh, switched connectors to use a connector called Lightning. And as a result, everybody who bought their docks, their alarm clocks, their, all that stuff that supported this particular device, that part of the reason that they went into that ecosystem was because the 30-pin connector went from device to device to device to device. Now has to go get either an adapter for between $30 and $40 for each of the uh, devices, or each of the connectors or docks or any of those things, if they want to continue to use their previous device or their new device. Yeah, their new device. If they want to use their new device with their old stuff, they have to get some sort of an adapter. They may also have to get adapter wires. This seems very un-Apple-like to me. And um, maybe. But it, the, what I had seen previously was that part of the beauty of that ecosystem was from device to device to device, there was continuity. And this breaks continuity. And they may do this again five versions down the road, and ten, so you may have to... Ten years from now, that's how all the documents It's roughly ten years old. Unless you bought it last year. So uh, this idea is one of these things that people t tend to argue against Android for. This idea that from device to device, even within a particular carrier or a particular provider of the hardware, may not be the same from device to device. But even on the alternative, it's not necessarily going to be the same yet. Let's talk a little bit about censorship. When you, is there a question? No? You're good? Editorial content. Editorial content. <laughs> Do you care to share? Yeah, uh, yeah I was told by Jamie you weren't supposed to write editorial. Yeah. I'm interested. OK. If, if the presenter allows, that's fine. Sure. Yes. If Apple had not gone to a lightning connector, the critics of Apple would jump up and down and frog at the mouth saying, oh, they're not adapting to new technology. They're using this 10-year-old technology. Is so anybody else using lightning? So you, they will. 
Um, and and within six months, the Chinese will make something for the seventy-five cents. Uh, or the Americans. Yeah. So the, you know, the thirty-nine dollars is is like it's a good Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I just like to know what's going on. So, uh, one of the things that's nice about the Google way of offering this operating system, this platform, is that they don't make any overarching demands. They don't say you can't do this. You can't do whatever it is that you want to do with our operating system. They would prefer that you don't offend anybody or represent, you know. Um, let's say hate groups or whatever, but they can't stop you from doing it. The licensing allows you to do whatever it is that you want with the operating system. Malware, if it is discovered as malware, and there are many people looking at the code that goes into the Play Store, is not allowed. They don't distribute malware knowingly. Nobody does. If there is malware found in the uh, iTunes Store, it would be removed. Um, if Google does not approve ideologically of whatever it is that you're doing, they do not necessarily remove it from their store. And I'll show you an example. So uh, this is a quote from a uh, blog called Make Use Of. It says, when you buy an iPhone, you're allowing Apple to censor content on your phone. They took out a uh, app called Phone Story, which was critical of labor practices in making iPhones, which of course was a recent story. And um, the reason that they pulled it was because it depicted violence or abuse of children, which is true, but it was in critique of the idea of abusing children. It was not proactively promoting the abuse of children. So uh, some people would argue that the reason that it was removed was because Apple didn't like the commentary that was being made about them. And when something gets removed because the provider doesn't like it, that's censorship. Yeah. Uh, if it's political, such as a throw shoes at Bush app, a breast jiggler, a naughty entry from the South Park guys, are some of the things that have been removed from Apple. And they don't necessarily explain in detail why they remove them. They don't have to. They just remove them. <laughs> they might say that they pulled it because it was offensive. But who was it offensive to? And who was it maybe not offensive to? Am I saying that I want these apps on my phone? No, but I'm saying that the idea that I should have the right to put them on my phone should be allowed. Uh, Android is often used for things besides phones and tablets. One of the examples of something that is forthcoming that remains to be seen whether or not it will be popular and useful is Google Glass. Anybody know about Google Glass? Okay, so Google Glass is a eyepiece, essentially, that goes around here. We'll see a video in a second that will show some more details about Google Glass. Uh, it uses Android at its base and essentially provides a point of view camera recording device. So as you walk through life, theoretically, you'd be able to record what you see as you go around. Is it for everybody? No. Is it a really interesting experiment that may surprise us with the ways that it will affect the way that we live? Maybe. Uh, Set-top boxes like Google TV. Apple TV is something that uh, Kurt talked about a bit, and uh, Google has a television addendum as well, something where you can search for shows on the network that you're on. If you're on Verizon, Fios, for example, uh, you can connect it to your Fios set-top box and uh, use the power of Google in order to look through your various available shows and make sure that you're recording them as you wish. Uh, laptops and desktops. You can use Android as a desktop operating system. And Google also is doing some interesting things with Chrome, where they have, for example, Chromebooks, where you have uh, a laptop, which just like any other laptop, you open it up, and all it does is run Chrome, which may sound silly at first. But as time moves on and we rely more and more on cloud-based services and less and less on local desktop-based services, uh, Chromebook makes sense. Android would be like um, me having all of the apps that I have on my phone available on a desktop. It would be a very powerful, potentially, operating system. USB keys. I'm going to show you in a second an example of uh, Android on a USB key. And again, this is all done 
not necessarily with Google's approval. They do like to approve and, and back things that are interesting and worthy, but it does not matter. If somebody wants to use Android to run an operating system on something that Google doesn't like, they can. Yes? Yeah. You are exactly correct. Yep. But it is an operating system. We are talking about operating system. There is some relation there. Not not that we necessarily stayed on just on operating systems. No. Okay, how is it run? Chrome runs on Linux as an operating system, which is a different kernel, which we're not going to go into great detail okay. about. Yeah. It would be interesting, though, to see if they could use Android underneath of it. Anyway, um, FXI Technologies has a USB stick that runs Android, and you can plug it into a screen that recognizes operating systems on a USB key and can run off of them. There are even some televisions where you can plug in a USB key, and it will recognize and allow an operating system to run. Um, you can see some specs here, but this is just to say that Android is not just about phones, not just about tablets, but sometimes about screens. So this was at uh, Google's recent I.O. conference in which they demonstrated for the first time their Glass project. And the way that they demonstrated it was kind of interesting. <laughs> they uh, had a bunch of, um, what would we call it? Well, I'll just show you. So this is sort of meta. This uh, screen here is somebody's Google Glass. It's recording what's going on in front of them. And down here, in the same way that we are broadcasting tonight using Google Plus Hangouts, they have a hangout going on. And they're about to jump. <laughs> so anyway, they jumped. They landed on the building. They came into the conference, all the time recording these events. They went down the side of the building, came into the conference. It was an interesting, exciting way to demonstrate this technology. But um, what was really interesting to me was that it had this Android operating system running underneath of these devices. And it remains to be seen whether or not this is going to be popular. Google has some real interest behind the Google Glass project. And everybody who has heard about it, I think, is interesting to see what interested to see what that's going to look like for them. So one of the things that um, I find particularly interesting about Android as an operating system is that uh, it can be changed. In, in the product as it is sold to you, you can throw applications on top of the operating system where you can change the look and feel. And one of the examples is actually something that came up in Kurt's uh, search results for the most popular apps. Uh, there is an application called, I know because I have it on my phone, or my tablet here. Nova Launcher. So Nova Launcher is an example of a, a skin that goes on top of the operating system in order for the look and feel to be changed however I wish for it to be changed. Another thing that's really common on Android phones is the ability to add widgets. Widgets are still not present on iPhone or iPads, yes? Kurt? Sure. Widgets? For the iPad? For any iOS device. No. Right. So if I 
want to flip through my screens. I just want to make sure because they just had a bunch of announcements today. Um, never. If, yeah, never. He, he said that a lot, didn't he? Jobs. Jobs, yes. Never. Uh, so if I want to get a quick view of what the weather is, for example, I can put a widget on my screen that just shows me what the weather is, and I can affect the size of it in relationship to other things on my screen. And that kind of flexibility, to me, is really valued. But to um, the iPhone e ecosystem, there, that's not part of the look and feel idea, yeah, right? It violates the idea of consistency. Right. It's it like violates the, the idea of consistency. And consistency is key for iOS. Consistency is key for iOS, except for the 30 pin connector. That's consistent. I guess. Uh, so you choosing the look and feel is kind of important. Multiple stores of applications and great native apps. So with the uh, advent of the Kindle Fire, one of the things that happened before the Kindle Fire was launched was that they made an app store. And a lot of people said, wait a second, why, are, why is there going to be another app store? I already have an app store for Google. This is forking uh, and making me have to make extra choices. But in fact, there are some things that are on the Android App Store that are different than what are on the Google Play Store. And so it, as far as I'm concerned, I get the best of both worlds. Um, and there are other app stores that are less popular. I think Dell had an app store for some time. Um, did they not? I thought they did. Amazon, has an, Amazon has an app store. Google has an app store. And if you wanted to have an app store, theoretically, you could. And they did it, though, in order to support their uh, Android-based device. And, but the thing that's really great is, even though I do not have a Kindle, I get the benefit of adding the um, Amazon App Store and seeing whatever is available in that store. To go further, even if there is an app that I want that is not on either store, as long as a developer makes it available in the form of an APK file, and they put it on their site. And if I trust them, which I should not, but if I want to, I can. I can go and install an app outside of either one of these stores or any other store. If a developer just wants to go outside of the process of having a store at all, and they just want to make their app available on their website, they can. I can download it. I can install it. And that kind of thing does not happen, again, probably because of consistency and security, according to Apple. Corporate America wouldn't like, doesn't like the Android. I'm not corporate America. You're not corporate America, are you? So um, let's talk about something that happened very recently. Uh, who here knows who David Pogue is? Yeah. You probably do. This is a uh, study that identified the most popular or influential tech journalists, tweeters, and tech blogs. And David Pogue shows up in all three. Here's what he had to say about the recent um, initial release of the Apple Maps app. He says, in short, Maps is an appalling first release. It may be the most embarrassing, least usable piece of software Apple has ever unleashed. Um, I have not seen it, but I usually trust what David Pogue has to say. He usually is very, very supportive of Apple. So it's really especially surprising to hear him say something so uh, degrading about something that they did, and it was a bit of a misstep. No, it wasn't. He's comparing a, he's comparing Apple Maps 1.0 yep. to Google Maps 9.0, which yep. is comparing Apple Maps 1.0 to Google Maps 1.0, yep. which had exactly the same problems. Possibly, possibly. Same problems. People were drying off the bridges. Well, uh, Tim Cook, <laughs> who's the CEO of Apple, apologized for it too. So, yeah. it, it's this kind of thing that um, makes me very happy to have a Google Maps app on my phone. And, and I've had it since the first, first version of Android. Uh, I was an early adopter of Android, and they had navigation on that first phone. And I was really, really excited to put down my TomTom -Tom device and pick up my phone, have all the functionality of my phone plus navigation. And um, I, I'm, I feel kind of bad for Apple right now because of this particular issue. They will solve it. They'll have a fantastic app probably in 
I don't know, some time. Five years. Five years. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm really glad that I have Apple or uh, Google Navigation on my phone. Rooting is not only expected on Android, but encouraged. And uh, does anybody here have a rooted phone? I will. So rooting is uh, having full and complete control over your device. It means that the, the word root refers to the most powerful user on an operating system, typically. Is that fair? Yeah. So uh, jailbreaking on, on an iPhone is uh, often called rooting in the Android world. And essentially what it means is that you can do anything. You can delete everything on the phone if you're not careful. And uh, what it allows you to do is to break rules that um, exist on the phone for protecting the phone from being destroyed. But it also allows you to do some fun, interesting things that you wouldn't be able to do without rooting. So um, there is a big controversy about the security of this. Right? It's, if you root your phone, theoretically, your phone can be destroyed very easily. But most of the time, the reason that you would root your phone is so you can do some interesting things. So this is uh, the Android developer's blog sort of defending this idea about security. And it says, allowing your own boot image on a pure Nexus S is as simple as running fast boot going in unlocked. It should be no surprise that modifying the operating system can give you root access to your phone. Hopefully, that's just the beginning of the changes you might make. The reason I bring this up is not necessarily because you are developers or you might even care about this, but that some interesting things can happen on your phone when it's rooted. And uh, Google wants you to root your phone, wants developers to root their phones so that they can play with it and do interesting things with it, which then trickle down to average users, typical users. Legitimately gaining root access to your device is a far cry from most rooting exploits. Traditional rooting attacks are typically performed by exploiting an unpatched security hole. They make it very easy for you to root as opposed to having to, to exploit a um, security hole on the phone by giving you this command, this three word command, in order to do it. So iPhone fans might say, uh, this doesn't matter because you can jailbreak your phone. Uh, Apple, though, thought to make jailbreaking illegal. Not just, we don't want you to do it, but we'll make it an actual crime if we catch you. They, they tried <laughs> to make it so that you could actually be legally held responsible for rooting your phone. So in response to the idea that uh, Samsung messes up the Android experience, I would say, well, if you're concerned about that, maybe you should look at uh, the devices that Google actually puts their name and brand on. They, they, there are a couple levels. There are, you can have an Android device that has no association with Google other than the fact that it has Android on it. Then there's another level where they will put their name on a device that uh, meets some standards. And what it means is that they will allow their apps to be run on that phone. And then uh, a step further than that is the Nexus line of devices. This is an example of a Nexus device. This is the Nexus 7. It's a tablet. It was Google's uh, first Nexus branded tablet. And it's been a very successful device. It's about $200 for the 8 gigabyte version, $250 for the 16 gigabyte version. And that price point makes it almost a impulse buy. You know, I feel like you'd be walking through your CVS and they'd just be sitting there, you know, next to the register, and you say, "Yeah, I'll take one of these two. So uh, the Nexus devices are interesting, and the Nexus Seven in particular. This is George. He is a good monkey and always very curious. Oh, 
Columbia is 238,900 miles of the rainbow to come. Five, four, three, two, one. So it's a cute ad, but it also emphasizes there's only a few ads they put out that are just about the the Nexus tablet. They go into more detail with specific features and other advertisements. And uh, this is to show you that they, they really try to make it so that it's like a lifestyle device, almost like a Kindle. And while they don't show it too much in there, there are a couple key um, Google features that they're emphasizing, such as video conferencing through Hangouts and that kind of a thing. So speaking of Hangouts, I just want to show gives you just the right information at just the right time. Swap up from the bottom of your tab or touch the Google search. Not even necessarily to show you the feature, but just to show you the way that Google is trying to sell these ideas. And you can, I'll make this presentation available. You can watch these videos if you want. Um, but it's not the most important thing. Yeah. OK. So they are really trying to, to uh, inform the audience about what they can get out of this experience because I think there are a lot of uh, things that people believe that they don't necessarily know to be true and so by doing these demonstrations in their ads which is I think a good technique they give some insight into what you can expect with these devices this is not a Google ad this is a longer advertisement for an app on the device but again we're not emphasizing anything but operating system We did, whoops, we did um, get some news today from Apple about their newly available uh, mini device. But before that, we had the iPhone 5. The common belief by most people who are familiar with Android would say that the, the best competitor for the iPhone 5 in the Android world is the Samsung Galaxy S3. Does anybody have an S3? How do you like it? Yeah, it's a beautiful device. I'm getting one for Christmas. <laughs> I wish I was getting one for Christmas. I have an older uh, Android device for a phone, but uh, because it's a Nexus device, it has the latest, greatest operating system. I don't have to run into those problems that other carriers and developers sometimes. Okay. Um, but with my Nexus, I usually get the latest, greatest operating system upgrades. And that's part of the reason why I choose Nexus devices as opposed to other devices. So uh, this is not to say who wins, who loses, because quite honestly, the iPhone 5 is hard to beat um, from a specification standpoint. But I do want to show you that probably for a lot less money, you get a similar experience uh, from, a, from a, spe a specification standpoint. You know, they're not wildly different numbers. What's the difference in price? Difference in price is probably not listed. Probably because it varies according to the developer. How much does an iPhone 5 cost? With a contract? Yeah, contract. with a contract. The contract an iPhone 5 is $200 for a 16 gig device. Yeah. It probably would be similar for a Samsung so Galaxy the price S3. Is the same. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. Uh, if you buy outside a contract, I, I bought this device outside a contract and it cost me $600 because I don't have a contract. I have unlimited text number, you know, all that stuff with T-Mobile. And so if I wanted to, though, if I was making the same choice today, I would go and get the Nexus that Google sells on its website for $200 even though there's no contract. It would be not as nice as a, a Samsung Galaxy 3, but it would not be bad. And here is a very hot set of numbers. These are specifications for the brand new, uh, newly released iPad Mini. You can see those prices at the top are uh, 
fresh off of the announcements today. Those numbers are correct, yes? Oh, I have Yeah. Yeah, those are correct. Yeah. So you, anybody who is familiar with, with Apple would expect that there would be more of a cost associated with it because there is usually an equation of higher cost or higher price, higher quality. But I would suggest that there are similar qualities going on. And one thing that is not listed on here is a newly planned device that is closer to the previous iPad. That is a 10-inch Nexus device that's probably going to be a hit at Christmas. So <laughs> there's a link here for 50 reasons why you would choose an S3 over an iPhone 5, but I'm not going to go into that because I have a five-minute mark. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, we have our two competitors up front. You are each allowed to take up to three questions from the audience. So uh, let's we'll start. Any questions for Kurt first? Any who want to ask Kurt a question on his presentation? Question for either one. A question for either one? Oh. Okay. Um, I'm one of the users who does not like to pay for apps, and if I were upgrading from my um, Android phone to an iPhone, are there free apps that aren't games? I don't play games, but if I wanted a metronome or something like that, are they free where they are in the world? So no, you can get free apps. Yeah. I'm sorry. So Janie came to me beforehand. She said, do you have an applause meter I said, no, we don't. So I said, let me go look. So I downloaded one. That was free. So yeah, there's, there are tons. You have 600,000 apps to choose from. I think right. you can find lots of free ones in there. And the games that my kids play are mostly free. Right. So the question is... Yeah, I know, but I'm just... But I don't buy free apps because... I'm sorry, I don't usually buy free apps because I, I actually I use them for work and whatnot, so I end up having to pay for the feature set I need, but there are tons of apps, free mail app, email apps, there are uh, free um, browser apps, there are few free uh, video capture apps, lots of free photography apps, yeah, there's, there are lots of free apps. They're usually ad supported though. And usually what happens too, yeah. thanks, usually what happens too is that you, you might hear the argument, for example, this is one of the things that sold me was, how much money do you spend on, maybe you don't drink coffee either, but I drink a lot of coffee. And so I end up spending, I have like a budget for coffee. <laughs> uh, if I compared the budget for coffee comparative to the budget that I was spending on apps, it would be 100 to zero, right, in percentage. So once I started to think about that and think about how much more I use applications on my phone and want to support those ideas, all of a sudden, my, my mind switched, and I said, it's okay to spend a dollar on an app. It's okay to spend $5 on an app if it's a really good app. Um, if there's value for it, all of a sudden, it makes sense. And I definitely want to support developers because I want them to continue to be able to uh, make great ways to use my phone or my tablet. But there are plenty of free applications available yeah, on for sure. On both platforms, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And there's plenty of paid applications available on the, um, oh yeah, it's not all free. It's not all free in the in the Android market. Right. And there's often a free version and a paid version, and you can usually get rid of the ads and everything else when you go paid. And I'm one of the probably the few people of Droid who does pay sometimes for my apps. Oh, I pay all the time. I mean, I, once I made this argument to my to myself of I'm spending money on lots of little things with incidentals. Why wouldn't I? When I drink a cup of coffee, it doesn't it doesn't help me to do my work better necessarily, oh, wow. uh, whereas an app does, it, it, or an app can, or it doesn't give me the joy that a game does. It doesn't necessarily, you know. So all of a sudden, me spending a dollar or two dollars or something it's makes more easy. sense. It's what? very easy to spend that ninety nine cents. That's it. Okay. Any other questions? questions? Yes. Up front. Um. What have you heard or what have you uh, read about the Microsoft's Surface tablet? Oh. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, I'll go over here. 
Okay, the question is about the Microsoft Surface. Microsoft package. Surface. Lots of IT folks in large corporations will drool over it. The rest of us will ignore it. <laughs> I try not to use Microsoft products. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've heard a lot so about it. So it's business friendly, but not. Um, it's it, it doesn't yeah, necessarily it's, mean. I mean, they want it to be a, a just as fun as these other devices. But I personally feel I personally feel like they're a bit of a latecomer, and yeah. and that's that's I think typical for Microsoft to come in and say, "How are we going to?" That's my personal belief. Other people feel differently. Some oh. people love Microsoft. I'm afraid for this. Thing. They're 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 caught between. Open, right, and something that has everything that Microsoft should have been five years ago, right? So they're coming, you see, they're coming late to the party, but now they're caught between their number one top competitor in, in the market and something that's the, the number one, you know, one top competitor in the open market. There's nothing in between. There's no room left. And what's interesting yeah. too is, I mean, what ten years ago Microsoft had tablets. Mm -hmm. no. Here, just stand right there. <laughs> so you, they can have uh, they they have been in the tablet market for a long time, uh, but they did it sort of ahead of the curve, and then Apple came along, made a mint on the iPad, and everybody else said, "Oh, we should do that too." The Nexus was a late comer to the market as well, not nearly as late as the Surface, but. Um, yeah. I think we can compare that to Microsoft entering the Bing when it did as a search engine. Correct. Right. And they're still struggling with that one. They are. But who uses Bing? Anybody know. here uses Anybody Bing? Anybody use Bing? Yeah. yeah it's Not unless I have to. As a matter of fact, I don't use Foursquare anymore because it uses Bing Maps when it passes oh, through like Facebook. Yeah, it's horrible. Okay. Is there any other questions? Yes, third row. Yeah, one, one simple one. I don't know too much about Apple products, but if I were to buy an iPhone or an iPad, how smoothly would I be able to use Google products such as Mail, Calendar, Drive? Except for Maps, I think you'd have a similar experience. Is that fair yes, to say? Yes, it's fair. It's uh, maps. Google is a maps. Except for Maps, yeah. The Maps thing is the Maps thing. I'll address after, but it, Google. Is a first-class citizen on an iOS device. Okay. So your mail, you go in to add the mail account. It actually says add Google Mail, add Google Calendar, Google add Google Plus. Contacts. Google, Google Plus is there. You can install Google Chrome on your on your iPad if you want to. You can install Google uh, Voice on your iPad if you want to. Uh, Google Latitude works on an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, what else do they make? A whole bunch. A whole of bunch stuff. of other stuff. Uh, um, the YouTube app supposedly is available too, so you can download and put that on your iPhone or iPad. Right, that was not on the old. The the Maps thing was more of uh, a decision by Apple. So Maps. There was a lot of back room with the Maps room stuff. Apple Maps on the original Apple device was actually Google Maps. It used Google's data. Apple built the interface, but it was Google's data. The only thing that's changed. Is they no longer are using Google's data? They're using TomTom's data, which apparently is terrible. And, and other, well, and uh, other yeah, stuff. they're trying to integrate a lot of different providers of that data, and that's not easy to do. And they right. just found out how not easy it is. But they had, they had to do what they did. Now, uh, the fact is that Google Maps, the the way that Google had um, worked it out with Apple, the deal to develop the, the original Maps on on iOS. Was that uh, since Google didn't have any mapping, and, and uh, sorry, Apple didn't have any mapping. Google was the only thing in town. They had a deal where Apple paid them for the data and also provided additional bits of information about how you were using the device, uh, information that would be of interest to a marketing and advertising company like Google. So, in effect, Apple was helping its competitor gain market information on how Apple's customers were using the device. So they had to. Kill it eventually. It just it didn't make any sense. It would be like if they yeah they they just had to. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, sorry, yeah. there, oh, go ahead. There was, well, there's a question in the back that she's been very patient. Oh, okay, so, go ahead. 
I can't I can't I can't my question is um, you know, as a basic user of the device, right, one of the things that I love about an Apple device is I, uh, I go to the website, I want to print it, and they print, and I can find out why my print, you know, browsers don't. Talk about that to press printing. How does that work on an Android device? I don't know, I don't print. I have, that's what I have. So the question was about printing on an Android device? Yeah. So I, I was told a story recently about someone who bought a Samsung, is it, is it a Galaxy or whatever? A Sa someone who bought a Samsung recently, and they also had a Samsung printer, and when they attempted to print from their Samsung Galaxy device to the Samsung printer, it failed. But the iPad was able to print to it flawlessly. So... That's the question is, do, do, do these Android devices support printing natively? What printers do they support? Blah, 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 that stuff. I don't know. I don't know anyone who prints from a... I, I've never printed. Yeah, I've never I, printed I print from, from my phone. iPad all the time to my printers at home, so... I actually don't... I, I mean, just as an ecological personal measure, yeah, I don't print paper unless I absolutely have to. Can you to. print a PDF? You can, sure. You can, you can, if you have certain PDF apps, you can print a PDF and then print that PDF however you want. Printing directly is another issue. I've, I just don't have a need for it. But um, there is a Google project that was uh, supporting the idea that you could use um, printing over Wi-Fi. And I never really looked into it because printing is not my thing. Do you know the project I'm talking about? Yeah, I just don't know that much about it. Two more questions. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. um, well, being an Android user, I've never been an Apple user. And there's nothing really that ever convinced me to go to Apple. I think it's the same thing, you know, like versa. It just seems to become two separate worlds when I'm talking to somebody. Oh, I'm iPhone team, I'm Android team. I don't care really what you do, if that's what you like, that's great. It just sometimes feels like, Apple you know, Oh, it's completely opposite. <laughs> you, no. Okay, so uh, let me tell you this. You go you go to Google Plus and hang out as an Apple person for more than one day and tell me if you don't get a death threat by the end of the day. Because I'll show it to you. I'll print out my Google stream. <laughs> yeah. I, no. I, in in my work I'm an integrator. I, I yeah. like to bring people together, and I'm pretty sure that Kurt is that way too. Yes. The whole reason this came about is because we constantly have these fun little conversations about, how about this? You can't do that, can you? And I say, oh, well, how about yeah. this? You can't do that, can you? And I actually met uh, Kurt in, in a Linux users group, which is an open source community. And we have a lot more in common than we ever do separate. And this is more fun than yeah. anything for us. I think we both think it's kind of funny when people get into these fanboy wars. I'm, I, this is my MacBook Pro. <laughs> I, I use Apple products without any issue. I also use Windows products if, yeah. if I have to. And I, I try to use a little bit of everything because that makes me a better technologist. I try to help people who are on different operating systems to do whatever it is they need to do because it's in my best interest to be able to help people no matter what platform they're on. Um, Absolutely. And I'm just going to jump in here as, and to say from the library standpoint, uh, when we planned this program, originally it was going to be come learn about smartphones and just kind of a straight presentation and putting it in this format of a smackdown yeah. and a competition it was just fun. a way to kind of give serious information in a fun format. And yes, John and Kurt are friends in real life. They, we all know that each system has its own merits. So what we're really just trying to do is impart information about each system so that everybody can make their own informed choice. And instead of just making it a straight on presentation, which is kind of boring, we tried to liven it up a little bit and be innovative. So that's what tonight is. I mean, at the end of the night, these two guys are going to go and sit down and have a cup of coffee together and, and chat away about how much they don't like Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> well, we both agree on that. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> As someone has tweeted something that they finally agree on. Um, so anyhow. Yeah, yes. we don't. We don't. Neither one of us like Okay, so I think Adnan has the last question of the night before we uh, determine if we have a winner or if we're going to declare it a tie. No, you shouldn't buy the Microsoft Surface. <laughs> okay, Adnan. Well, I wanted to just actually mention about the printing because I've gone through Apple devices and now this Android device, 
So there's pluses and minuses on both. But I think uh, neither one uh, platform is, good, is perfect when it comes to printing because with the Apple device, you've got to get the Apple uh, ready printer. Yes. And with the Android de devices, you have to download an app if you have an HD printer or a different type of printer. And I just, uh, in my opinion, when you're trying to figure out which device to get, nothing beats actually being in the store and playing with it over several days, going back and forth before you make uh, uh, a decision. And actually, the Google Nexus, with for such a small amount of money down compared to the iPad product, product uh, it's finally a device where I actually see um, something that I can give to my my son's grandparents, um, and they wouldn't have to uh, be too vocally confused. They wouldn't need the theoretical PhD in order to use it. Yeah, it's cloud print. Cloud print, thank you. Okay, so we have heard from Kurt about Apple, iOS, and we have heard from John Lamazny about the Android system, and now it's time for our, our audience to decide which presenter made their case better for their operating system. Now this is not about whether you prefer Apple or whether you prefer Android. It's about the case made tonight for the merits and the drawbacks of each system over the other. Now Kurt's bringing up his applause meter on his device here. I have mine. My free app. <laughs> mine was free as well. My free app and his free app on my Samsung Galaxy <laughs> and his phone. Okay, so i got to be quiet here because I get device. it exercised. <clears throat> Kurt, step out to the middle here. If you uh, please give your applause for Kurt. Okay. Now, did yours register a high? It did, but I don't know if it was reset at the time. The peak was 101. Mine peaked at 99. Well, they're pretty close. Yeah. Okay, so John, come forward. We'll put that at 100 then. <laughs> Wanted to make sure then he has 100 decibels of applause. Everybody quiet. Let's reset the devices. What did you come in at? I don't know. It, it, oh, it didn't reset. It didn't reset yeah. No, it did. 98. Mine came in at 94. Okay. So Kurt wins. No. no. I thought you won. You were yeah. a hunter. Oh. Yep. Mine. There you go. Oh. I didn't reset. Here. It's a close, close debate tonight. Obviously, both systems have a lot going for them. The idea is Four to help make you a more informed consumer when you go out to purchase your smartphone that you know the pluses and the minuses to each system. And what we'll do now is we'll go out of, the, out of the hangout here. Thank you for tuning in from home. And uh, both Kurt and John are willing to stay and talk geek with you until the library closes at night.